Hi everyone, my name is Barb Cartwright and I am the CEO of Humane Canada and I want to welcome you to our session on sheltering in a post-COVID world. I'm just going to pull up a PowerPoint presentation now to share with you uh, just to get you orientated to our session today and then we'll get started. Great, so thank you for joining us. Uh, as you all know, in mid-March, our world's all shifted significantly and animal shelters around Canada had to pivot to ensure that they could continue to provide the important community services that they provide day in and day out for animals and the people in our communities across the country. Social distancing, disease prevention, government orders, funding shortfalls or even funding drying up altogether, all led to a need for rapid evolution in the way that we shelter animals in Canada. And it also pointed in a direction for a new model going forward. Over the past two months, humane societies, SPCAs, animal shelters, animal rescues, municipalities have all been meeting on a regular basis in order to discuss how to deal with the COVID crisis in the immediate time, as well as to start thinking about what those impacts will look like long term on our sector. And so it's a great opportunity at the National Animal Welfare Conference to have this discussion, to look at some of the key learnings that have been already had and the ways in which we can pivot and innovate going forward. So I wanna start by welcoming our panelists who are with us today. We have Bruce Roney, President and CEO of Ottawa Humane Society. He's been with the Humane Society for 20 years and in that time has led it to become a premier organization and have one of the top shelters in the country. He is sought after across the country and really across the continent for consultation and feedback and he and his team deliver training for shelters all across the country. Elise, uh, the executive director of Montreal SPCA with the chicken, I love that picture, Elise is the CEO or the executive director of Montreal SPCA. She's also the author of several books on animal welfare that have been translated into multiple different languages. And if you had a chance to look at her uh, bio, she feels that the time that she spent as uh, working with an airline during the 2002 SARS outbreak, as well as her love of a game, a pandemic game, has really set her up well to deal with the different things that have been coming at her and her shelter during this time. And then finally, I want to introduce Javier, who is the CEO of Winnipeg Humane Society and will be our first presenter. Uh, he's been in that role since 2015 and really feels strongly that his passion around aligning the needs of the community with the passions of those who work for Winnipeg Humane Society is particularly important. He's also an instructor and um, actually teaches communications, online communications and marketing to senior managers across North America. So thank you so much for uh, all being here and taking the time to really shed light on what it's been like for you and your organization over the last two and two and a half months and the skill and expertise that you bring to this conversation on how you can help people think about where we need to go next. I wanted to just take a few moments to uh, give you uh, an outline as to what this next um, 60 minutes are going to be like together. So we're doing the introductions right now. And we're going to go to a presentation from Javier on what it was like at the Winnipeg Humane Society during the crisis, what innovations that they brought in right away, and what the impact has been. Then we'll step out and have a discussion with all of the panelists and see what are the similarities that they experienced in their shelters, what have the challenges been, and, and how do they see this pandemic uh, evolving in their shelter. Then we'll take another moment to step back into presentation mode and I'll bring up a uh, PowerPoint slide, just one slide, to take a look at some of those trends uh, that we've been looking at over the last few years with regards to animal welfare and animal sheltering in Canada in order to really contextualize the conversation following it with the panel on their reflections about innovations that we need to continue to maintain coming out of the immediate crisis and going into the long-term change for sheltering in Canada 
and we'll have some concluding remarks and that will be the conclusion of our presentation. So I am gonna hand over the screen right now to Javier to, to do his presentation for us on how will history remember us. Javier, I love that title. I think it's very evocative and I'm looking forward to your presentation. And uh, thank you all for joining uh, virtually this, this presentation and I look forward to the uh, discussion. So um, what um, you know, I, I prepared for you today is uh, a bit of an overview of how things kind of started, what actions we've taken, uh, what we have learned through these two, you know, these past two months, and where do we see the future of animal sheltering and in general of a humane society um, moving forward. So um, we're living in what can be called a new normal. Um, you know, I don't know if you remember what life was before, uh, you know, uh, social distancing rules and all the public health orders that are coming every day that we need to interpret and operationalize in, in our shelters. Uh, but essentially, we know this, the pandemic has offended our lives, uh, both in our work and um, in anything else that affects society. And certain things that um, have happened and are happening right now will have an enduring effect in the way that we operate. And the idea that I have today is to explore the present and the future uh, in that light. So I, I, I would like to get kind of a frame this. We are the Winnipeg Humane Society. The Winnipeg Humane Society is a 100% charity, so we're not government. We have uh, been in operations for 126 years. We're one of the oldest charities uh, in Manitoba and in, in Canada. And uh, we, uh, again, we're independently operated. So we, we are in a somewhat different position than other organizations. We do have a contract with the province of Manitoba to enforce animal welfare laws in the city of Winnipeg, and that is done through animal protection officers. So some of our staff have been given that status and we uh, are a contractor to the, uh, the province under uh, the chief veterinary officer. And we also handle all the stray cat uh, animals uh, situation uh, for the city of Winnipeg. Those are the two contracts that we have with government. But in terms of operations, uh, it's 100% fundraising the way that we operate. And our shelter, our budget is roughly $7.5 million. The number of animals, around 9,000. So, Starting uh, when we heard, you know, the public health orders coming in and, and we were paying attention to what was happening, uh, we looked at what are our strengths, our weaknesses, our opportunities, and, 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 and you know, analyze it. So we have a great commitment from staff. Uh, we have medical grade standards, as most of animal shelters do. And we have some contingent plans in terms of disaster preparation uh, that we can start to rely on. Uh, we so opportunities as well in terms of accelerating certain changes uh, that we were wanting to do and the shutdown of uh, society allow us to pause certain things and think about you know are we going to continue to do this in the future and that's a theme that you're going to hear uh, from me throughout the presentation um, an opportunity to really serve the community uh, is important for a charity that relies on donations to survive to be there for the community and something that I keep telling my team, people will remember what we do. So we need to have a sense of history, being that the were for Humane Society is 125 years old, 126 years old. Uh, weaknesses, we are not a nimble organization. We're a fairly large shelter, in, we're the largest in Manitoba, and, and, and you know we, we, we don't move quickly, and we have to move quickly. Uh, protocols and you know public health directives were happening on a daily basis, so we had to really work on the fly. And there were some communication breakdowns within the team because, again, uh, trying to make changes and not thinking who needs to know uh, was definitely uh, a challenge. And in terms of threats, there was a lot of fear and uncertainty with staff and our volunteers. Um, we have a staff of 120 and 750 act active volunteers. Uh, the impact on adoptions, because we had to shut down our doors, we um, continued to adopt animals, but we couldn't just leave the doors open for anyone to come and see. 
And what if there was a severe revenue reduction? That was a threat that we need to take into consideration. So we had to develop a new operating model in two weeks. That was roughly the, uh, the time. And we divided into two parts, um, you know, our emergency operations. And this is something also that not all of you may have experienced, but we were immediately deemed an essential service by the province of Manitoba because uh, our investigations and emergency response team needed to continue their work on animal welfare and our clinic. Uh, we have a clinic that um, is regulated through the uh, Manitoba Veterinary Medical Association and we are an emergency clinic. Those were deemed uh, essential services. And um, we are also given critical service status, which is one notch below, but it means you remain open no matter what, to intake adoptions, uh, behavior, and animal care. Intake because we serve stray cats, uh, they, they, you know, control them for the, the city. Uh, and then the understanding from the province that if we take animals in, they have to move somewhere. Um, and there are some um, aspects of what we do, behavior and animal care that are required you know, for us to move animals in and out. And then when it comes to management and business continuity, we quickly develop, and I can share it with anyone that is interested, although this has been deprecated because we're on phase two, um, we put together a plan very quickly, so, and we send it to staff and our volunteers, so everybody knew exactly uh, what are the objectives, what are the protocols, what documents we need, and every area was tasked to produce a plan um, with how the restrictions that were put in place were going to be uh, implemented. And we used Microsoft Teams to really put everything online and make changes as we learn more about the situation. So um, what inform with information changing on a daily basis, uh, we established, and, and knowing that communication breakdown is a challenge, we establish management huddles uh, five times a week, and then uh, one uh, once a week is your leadership huddle, and the huddle is Zoom. We all get together, we talk about what we need to talk, and then we disband. But that touch base has been so critical for us to uh, be able to um, continue to operate and quickly uh, troubleshoot any potential issues. We establish rapid response teams. Uh, so if we had a specific challenge, say, in intake or managing, um, you know, the provision of uh, masks or hand sanitizing uh, solution, who will be responsible and, and when that team needs to report back to the, uh, to the management group. And we really expand the use of technology, as you will see. Now, I am no Jeff Bezos. The only uh, commonality is that we're bald. Um, I, wish I had any other aspect in common with Bezos, but he is big in, in saying that, uh, you know, Amazon is obsessed with customer service. And what um, I told the team is that we must be obsessed with serving the community. And what that means, um, and, and we divide it into staff, so internal and external. Let me start with internal. So the main goal that we set up right off the bat is no layoffs. And that's tough. But we said, we're not going to let anybody go uh, if we can help it. You know, and I can, and, you know, I can say from now that we were so far successful in doing so, uh, but it meant making sure that we had the financial means to sustain ourselves and to avoid layoffs. Um, as we, you know, essentially send people home and paying them to be home. Um, each staff and manager processed what was going on very differently. And because we had to act very fast and, and, and make really a lot of operational uh, challenges, the, the challenge was to balance the safety of our team with the needs of the community. And uh, uh, my role primarily has been and continues to be someone that is here to call, to talk and to mentor. And you know, every day there's maybe a different team member uh, or a different situation or a member of the community. Um, and I'm here to provide that stability that the situation requires. Oh, I didn't know that I did that. 
when it comes to the community, uh, what we did is we say all, all critical services will be maintained. So of course, our investigations and emergency response, taking care of injured animals, uh, taking care of animals that can no longer be in, in, um, in, that are not in a safe situation. We have some domestic abuse cases and provide temporary relief to that. And um, in terms of you know, our, our revenue source, we were already on our way to generate a lot of uh, activities online and this just accelerated everything. And if, if there's anything that we've seen, it's an acceleration of certain things. So if traditionally we will rely on um, direct mail or phone calls to fundraise, now pretty much everything is primarily online. And compare 2020 to 2019, in terms of our uh, campaigns thus far, we actually have fundraised more this year than the year before. And the other thing that I'm big on is active social listening. So trying to understand with layoffs and with people uh, in, in, in different you know, um, situations and animals uh, in, 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 in different um, circumstances and situations, how can we best meet those needs? And I want to share with you how as quickly as I can, and I can certainly share that information in, in greater detail. Um, so we uh, first we we started having bedtime stories. So uh, um, personalities in the community reading uh, stories to their pets, and that people can share as well. Now that we have our kids at home, and we uh, we need to do something with them, um, we. Um, had some uh, animal encounters through our animal welfare consultant, uh, Brittany, with great success. And you will see the reach is between 6,000 and 7,000 that for a size of our community is really, really uh, excellent. Um, we created um, essentially boxes, care boxes that we distribute to women's uh, shelters and um, food banks and other organizations. And we had an unbelievable response from the, uh, from the public. We um, also uh, did a drive to provide food and supplies to our uh, partners in the north because they do not have access to uh, the supplies. There was a shortage of food supplies at one point. So we coordinated that with several rescues in, in, in Manitoba. Our reach there was almost 23,000 people. Uh, we uh, started to develop a lot of uh, online content. I call it WHS TV. So we have our veterinarians asking questions. You know, I'm here with my, I just adopted a, a, an animal or I'm here with an animal and noticing something I, I need to, you know, I need some support. So we, we developed that as well. Uh, we took a very strong stance on the uh, dreadful situation in the food supply. Uh, when it comes to animal processing and the link between farm animal welfare, transportation issues, and um, what is happening in, in plants across Canada, especially in Alberta and BC, um, with, again, a lot of shares and support. We uh, took our um, education programs online, and any student, any teacher that wants to use them now is available in an online library. Uh, we um, of course, continued adoption through social distancing, so appointment only, and we're doing quite well in that regard. Uh, our uh, adoptions numbers have held quite nicely. Our behavior team, uh, we can't have classes in the shelter, but they took those classes online and also provided a Q&A. And, and again, the growth week over week is unbelievable. We um, receive donations, we develop a food bank um, that is growing also uh, quite quickly and people are donating food and other items and we're very grateful for the support of the community and now we have these clients that rely on us to provide food for their, uh, for their animals. So this is just, and we, we had actually several more initiatives and we put them all together in two weeks with the directive of do everything we can to help the community. And yes, money is important and we were keeping an eye on it but the, the thought was, if we do the right thing, if people see the Winnipeg Humane Society there for the animals and, and advocating on behalf of animals and helping animals and humans, we should be fine. The challenges um, were balancing the amount of information 
all these programs, we can't just post them every day. So how we balance that and how do we communicate? And media has been a phenomenal partner uh, from uh, that perspective. Uh, staff concerns, fears of interacting with the public and how we have the protective equipment that they require. And of course, keeping an eye on cash flow, donations and grants, it's uh, important. Now let's talk about the, the future. And I am a certified geek uh, or nerd, you choose. Um, but the, the way that we frame this is, uh, there's a this book by uh, Annie Duke, poker player and also um, a researcher. Um, and her whole notion of thinking in bets, which means the future is uncertain. We have imperfect information. So we need to place a bet. And that bet should be based on data and taking into account luck. And we, uh, with that, we then ascertain, you know, what choices we make and how we rebalance the work of the shelter. So I want to talk about the next 12 months based on what assumptions we are making here, trends beyond the crisis and the three key takeaways that uh, we, we had so far in dealing with this pandemic. So uh, there's this wonderful story that I believe is unlocked for all subscribers, for uh, even non-subscribers from Atul uh, Garwandi at, in the, the New Yorker uh, magazine. And um, he wrote the Checklist Manifesto. And he said, you know, uh, in order to re-enter society after the, uh, the pandemic, there, there has to be, you know, certain things that are put in place, which we are in the process right now of completing so we can uh, expand our work uh, come Tuesday. Uh, washing hands constantly, uh, having the um, checklist and making sure that no individual that feels unwell comes to the shelter. The use of masks, we mandated masks. Any person entering the building through via appointment only needs to wear a mask that we issue. Uh, and we have now uh, going to start and to see a tent outside that is going to be our welcome center for um, individuals coming to interact with, uh, with us and social distancing, two meters and in, in uh, offices where that is not happening or drivers that are working in, in, in teams, what protective equipment and how we can ensure that there is the, uh, we take extreme caution when it comes to uh, dealing with um, their health. And we are also fully prepared to see a surge in demand, and we're seeing that more and more as more people unfortunately lose their jobs. A decline, potential decline in revenue, because and, and we're seeing it mostly in our corporate donors, because corporations right now have no cash flow to speak of, and being a once in a generation challenge. So, in you know, 2008 there was a great recession. This is going to be far worse, and we're expecting that this is going to be brutal when it comes to the job losses and the economy worldwide. And there will be some form of social distancing, so no return to any sense of normalcy until an effective treatment or a vaccine is in place, which we expect will be sometime in 2021. Now, things will look very different even after. And the exercise that we're embarking now, and I go, through this as quickly as I can, is essentially we have a toss pile, things that we're not going to do anymore, a keep pile, things that we used to do and we will keep doing, and a new pile, things that you know we were not doing that now we will do. And every area of the organization was asked to develop these community support programs and to evaluate what you know we're doing and, and, and why. So um, very briefly, adoptions. The idea is to keep the flow and uh, change the strategy, focusing more on length of stay. Intake, diversion, diversion, diversion. Our goal from here onwards is to have the least amount of animals coming to our shelter, the least amount. If we can keep strays where they are, we will. If you know, there's anything that we can do in terms of behavior support, individuals that are you know, struggling uh, with in animal behavior, we will help them before they need to surrender. If there are issues with affording medical care, we'll try to liaise with veterinarians or we can use our clinic uh, in cases I will feel confident that 
you know, the animals in good hands, that we can do that. Um, ensure that, you know, we engage the community uh, through our volunteer services, through our education services, doing a lot of things online. Our volunteer services, for example, we're starting uh, now through Zoom meetings to do um, orientation sessions. We have, and we're not open to all of these right now, but we had already 45 people that registered for our first online orientation session. You bet we're gonna keep doing that, absolutely. So we're, we're, we're essentially taking the things that um, are working and accelerating them and certain things that we used to do, like, you know, we'll accept pretty much any pet. Well, not anymore. Uh, we're going to really focus more on the need. Higher need comes in if we can manage it outside of the shelter. Uh, can, it, that's perfectly fine. So we're going really beyond calling ourselves a shelter. We are an animal welfare organization and we want to own it. Three key things that we learned thus far, and I'm done. Um, and, and, you know, Humane Canada has been phenomenal in their leadership here. The animal-human link requires a holistic approach. You, you, you can't parcel out what is happening in the home or anywhere between the animal and the human. So we have to really take care of both. And yes, we're an animal shelter, we're an animal wolf organization, but if we're really there for the animal, it means figuring out what else is going on and how we can support that individual or that family. Um, we believe that shelters must really, really focus on keeping animals out of here. Their behavior deteriorates, it's costly, and you know, you're, you're creating a separation. Do you need to create that separation? In animal welfare cases, yes. Everyone else, let's try not to. And um, we really believe, and I really believe, so I, I just pushed that into the team because they have no choice, I'm the CEO, um, that we need to think in bets. We need to think about, you know, what is the future based on the data that we have available? What is the luck that we may or may not have and essentially place a bet that may or may not pan out. And that's where iteration comes in. We will be in constant state of improvement. There's no final anything anymore. We will just look at the data, see what it tells us, see what changes in society are out there and continue to essentially adapt. Um, because yes, this pandemic has been a, a massive shock to the system, but society continues to move. And these are not buzzwords. This is the reality of managing uh, an animal shelter um, in, in today's world. Oops, I didn't know that I did that. So that, that is it, and uh, now I will turn it over to, uh, to Barb. Well, thank you, Javier, that was awesome. I was actually taking notes the whole time. Um, some real words came up to me during that, uh, accelerate, link, um, diverse, and think in bets. Um, really all, all struck me, but also the people will remember comment that you made at the beginning and some of those strong thoughts about how to shift a perspective of an organization when you, when you are in crisis. Uh, and the idea that organizations that survive these kinds of, of massive impacts are the ones that can shift and that can keep growing forward, even if it's in intention and programmatic and focus. So thank you so much for sharing that and bringing it into such a crisp, clear presentation. Uh, I'm sure everyone who watches it's gonna benefit from that and benefit about the thinking that you've shared. I wanted to um, check in with you, Elise. Uh, you're running uh, an organization, a leading organization in Canada, the, the longest um, running SPCA, the first SPCA in the country, which is amazing, but you're also in a hot spot in Canada. In fact, right now, the hotspot in Canada for this crisis. Can you share a little bit with us about, you know, as you were listening to Javier's presentation, but how you were thinking about um, Montreal SPCA and how your organization is responding in this crisis? Yes, it's fascinating to see that uh, Winnipeg and Montreal are two 
different um, cities and we like to think that we are different than the rest of Canada. But in this crisis, I think our approach is almost the same without even talking. Um, well, we had to do layoff. Um, I think the, the crisis is huge here in Montreal and will be there for a long time. But beside that, beside everything like ter terrible about the crisis, I see it like a perfect opportunity to do a shelter reset. I mean, we've been talking about a shelter reset for months and we're always like, yeah, but we cannot change that. It's going to take forever. We don't have time. We're too busy and we're always too busy and there's always too much to do. And now that everything is shut down, it's a great opportunity to rethink everything. And we make jokes that um, our head vet, uh, Dr. Carrière, has been pushing for so many things in the past months, um, like to control intakes, for instance, uh, to um, allow people to rehome their pet themselves, uh, to move to online services. And we're always too busy to do it. Well, now we're making jokes that maybe this pandemic is her fault. And she thought about it. And it was like the best opportunity to bring all the changes she was asking for. And, and it's amazing what we've been doing in two months. I mean, all those things that we were pushing for years, now they're in place. And what I've learned is that we can like try things, like Javier was suggesting, just try, evaluate, adjust. It doesn't have to be perfect the first time. And like, for instance, we um, ask people to um, uh, take, up, take appointment before they bring their animal to the shelter. And so we had to think of a system to um, see all those people that need to bring their animal and all that. So first, like we, it was like so, some notes in an Excel documents, and then we decided to do meetings and we like just improve and improve and improve. And now the system is working. And I think like now the, the only big challenge we have left is that the Wi-Fi is not working properly at the shelter. So we're all home like with amazing Zoom meeting and like good sound and everything. And the people working in the shelter, when we're trying to meet with them, it doesn't work because the Wi-Fi sucks. But that's the only thing left. Beside that, I mean, we could like be like this for months, even years. I mean, it's working. Pe people are bringing their email in but less than previous years so it's amazing and we find them families really quickly because even like we're in the middle of the storm people are willing to adapt and it's all moving quickly portals are open uh, we have time to uh, give the advice we want to give to people of course we do it over the phone or zoom or whatever but we have time and and we also have like space to develop new programs to keep families together so it's there's a lot of great things but um, but I have to think of like all those people, like I'm, I'm lucky I'm home with my cats and it's great. And of course I'm working really long hours, but I don't have to take the, the subway. So it's really good. But those people in the shelter right now are scared. I mean, the situation in Montreal is scary right now. There's like more than 100 deaths every day. So it's something like awful. A lot of people have like, are living with their parents that are older or taking care of them. Um, people that are at risk. So um, we, beside all those like amazing things that we're bringing, we need to keep on communicating with the people that are on the ground, taking care of the animals that are scared to come to the um, shelter every day. So think, talk, communicating, communicating, adjusting and um, listening to people. Elise, are you concerned about uh, July 1st, the move date? Uh, yes, we are. Um, in, in Quebec, I think it's not the same in the rest of Canada, but in Quebec, everybody, everybody's moving on July 1st. Um, it's something really weird. Why move when it's so warm outside? But yeah, it's uh, something like that. And um, one of the big problems we have is like, um, it's really hard to find an apartment uh, in Quebec right now. An apartment that allows animals are really hard to find. Every year, it's a complete nightmare. Uh, people cannot find apartment uh, that allows um, their pet, especially dogs. And uh, this year might be even worse. And we, like every year, we have a lot of people bringing their animals because they cannot find home with for their animals. And we think it might be worse this year. We asked uh, landlords for compassion through a campaign. We got like 
dozen of signatures. Uh, it's hard to know if it's working, um, but um, we are, we're doing everything we can uh, to ask landlord to show compassion and like to just to help people finding solution. But it's, it's might the, the next week might be like quite challenging for us. Thank you, Elise. Yeah. Bruce, uh, I think about you a, a lot and how well known Ottawa Humane Society is for its meticulous, life saving, organizational developing policies and protocols, and you share them widely. How is your team, how are you pivoting in this crisis? Well, it's very interesting, as Elise um, alluded to, we're making independent decisions and coming up with the same answers across the country. And, and I think that, you know, this conference is going to be a, a pivotal point for the movement and that we can see, see one another and learn from one another about um, some of the best practices we've had to put into place or guessing about to a certain degree. Um, but everything, uh, we weren't as quick uh, off the mark as Winnipeg to get things online. Um, we're working on that now. Um, but I think uh, we were quite successful in protecting our staff really, really quickly. Um, that was our number one priority from the get-go. Um, and certain things like uh, we have two teams now. We have an A team and a B team, and they're never here at the same time. Um, both to protect the staff themselves and to ensure that if we did have uh, a staff member who was infected, we could bring in the other team and, and uh, you know, care for the animals that we need to. So um, frankly, my day is involved with HR and communications and public relations. That's what I think we've learned through uh, this crisis is it's about those two things and we are essential. And everyone is, I think, across the country has stepped up and, and risen to that occasion of being an essential service because I don't think in all communities that's, that's been clear all along. Um, and I think with government, there's opportunities going forward um, to be saying if we're to be an essential service, then we need to be funded like other essential services. So I think that's going to be uh, one of our agenda items and our challenges going forward. It has been interesting with the essential services conversation. I actually just got an email yesterday that New Brunswick uh, still isn't exactly an essential service, but they're being told that to continue operating. So um, I think it's now eight out of 10 provinces have, have put it formally in that uh, animal shelters are an essential service, but it's still not all the way across the country, even though their services are still being required to be open or are still in need. Um, by the public and the government. So it's an interesting one. Bruce, out of, the, out of the changes that you've put in place, you know, are there two or three that you think right now you have to maintain this is going forward with you, with Ottawa Humane Society? Absolutely, and it, it really, again, mirrors Winnipeg to a great degree. I think we're, we're going to be um, looking much more carefully at our intake and why we're taking animals in. Um, I think with cats and kittens in particular, we know that, that even the best shelters, because of just the nature of cats, uh, can put their health at risk just by sheltering them. So why are we continuing to do this? And if they come to us, um, they're probably, the majority of them are better off in foster homes. So we had uh, ramped up our foster program uh, very, very quickly, uh, and our volunteers were amazing. Um, stepped up, the community stepped up. We've done, like Winnipeg, we've done our orientations online. It went extremely well. So why have people drive to, to an orientation if it can be done just as well online? And, and you know, quickly increase the number of uh, homes for animals in the community because they're better off there. Um, the other thing is, is with our staff. I mean, we were amazed when we moved into our not new shelter anymore when it was uh, new in 2011, how quickly um, it filled, not with animals, we have typically the space we need for animals, um, but our programming increased so dramatically, we ran out of space for people. And um, <clears throat> we're discovering through the pandemic that not everybody needs to be here. Uh, and so we're actually um, developing, developing a plan to put in a, a VPN system, which we've never used really out of security concerns. Um, but that's, that technology has come a long way and there's absolutely no reason 
uh, why everyone needs to be on site all the time and we can expand our programming without expanding our office space. So that's, I think that's another one that we're, uh, we're going to take away from this. Great. And Elise, same question. Uh, what are one or two, three things that you can see right now that Montreal SPCA will be continuing uh, into the future? Well, first, like in, ter in terms of like uh, HR, um, online meetings work amazingly. Like Zoom is great. I mean, it's, it, it's tiring to spend your days in front of your computer, but still it's, it's working great. I mean, we've been struggling for years to find ways to meet all the people together, like everybody's on a different schedule and all of that, but Zoom meetings and you record it for people that cannot attend, it's perfect. And we do trainings on Zoom, it's, it, it's great. Uh, we also have um, office space challenge like, like Bruce. And now we see that we can, we can work from home, which is, which is great. And um, we know that we can um, control the intakes. I mean, we were scared of doing it. What will the community say? Well, we know, we know that now the community supports us and understand why uh, bringing an animal in a shelter is probably not the best thing to do. So, and there is options. So it's something like, I didn't know was that easy to put in place. Oh, sorry. I don't know if I'm... Am you? No, Javier, Javier, sorry. For you, what's one or two things that you tried that didn't go so well? Um, well, we, um, that's a, a good question. I'm trying to think um, the, the uh, I, I'm not quite, quite sure that we, um, we had a, like a, you know, a, a big setback on, on things that we have, uh, we have tried. Um, you know, we um, we continue to do pretty much the um, you know all, all these initiatives. I, I I think that in, in in terms of online initiatives, is the cost benefit of each of them that we're looking at. And, and one of the things that we're doing right now is an evaluation of you know what works or what doesn't. So what one of the things that are, are not working that well is we're overwhelming people through social media because of the number of videos and, and different um, offerings that we have. So um, we just discussed today that we're going to scale back the number of information that we share um, because we, it's just too much and then it gets a little bit um, confusing. And um, the other is more just the expectations. It, it, it's, um, our biggest concern is, is managing those expectations. So the, the worry that we had with the clinic, if we're going to treat animals that have a caregiver that is not surrendering into us, is how big and how scalable that is for, uh, for a team that is socially distanced. So we, uh, as Bruce mentioned, don't have all the team all the time at the same time. And uh, we chose to uh, essentially just use our emergency responders and select um, veterinarians that we know to kind of pilot the project. And we see that uh, we can, this can grow, but we're quite concerned if we actually can make it work. And the, uh, the other thing right now is Manitoba is really relaxing a lot of the social distancing rules. So we are preparing to uh, host a uh, day camp. Oh, wow. And um, it's, complicated uh, because the numbers are small because uh, we need to keep them really not inside the shelter we we have a behavior training center so we're going to do it there um, but there's a lot of questions that we need to answer and and that uncertainty i think managing that uncertainty has definitely been a challenge as well great did did any of you have questions for each other you can you can talk to each other too well something i like one of the things that surprised me is that, yeah, moving everything as online is a no brainer, but a lot of people in our community do not have internet access, do not have access to a computer or a phone. So for us, it's, it's obvious to tell people, yeah, don't bring your animals at the shelter, go on this Facebook group, but they don't have Facebook, they don't know what it works sometimes they don't even know how to write. So it's something that we have to keep in mind in the, in the future that everything we're doing now, um, online, all of that, we are, 
we're leaving people behind and these are people in our community that needs us the most so we need to maybe help them to um get internet access teach them how it works uh, but it, we we cannot like think that that's the only way um, to go i mean meeting meeting the an animal online for an adapter works 80 percent of the time but for a lot of people that are a bit older that can be really nice family for an animal well zoom is something that doesn't work i mean even for my parents i've been trying for two months to um call them in any way i can think of and it doesn't work they like the, the real old phone I do find the um, it, it's interesting how fast we can innovate when we need to um, and how resistant we can be to innovation when we don't want to. I think about Zoom and even I think it was two years ago, my board chair first said we should start using it and I was resistant and then we started using it and still most people either wouldn't come on or they wouldn't put their camera on or they phoned in and now everybody comes on and it's it's really simple. So it's like a barrier dropped but in that race to to uh, reach for that easy part we do think about that too what do we what happens to all the people that even here in barhaven uh bruce i don't know if you've had that example bruce and i are both in ottawa but i've had staff who live in barhaven barhaven that have sketchy internet and so we can't we can't leave all that behind so i think that's a, a really great point and actually leads us well into uh, the next part of our presentation so i'm just going to share with you all a screen from my computer. Oh, sorry, there we go, one back, one forward. So starting to think forward, we've just gone through what happened over the last two and a half months and some of the areas that we think it's pointing to. It's been an interesting time um, in that the leaders of the humane sector and, and the three of you have been very involved in this have been engaging in strategic conversations over the last, you know, three or four years about what are the shifting trends and the challenges that those are bringing that we're seeing in animal welfare, in animal sheltering, and how do we as a sector respond to that. Um, you know, we've talked about the shifting in the shelter population. So some places experiencing less dogs, some people having too much cats, some places in the States with too much dogs that are trying to ship dogs into Canada. And so we see this real um, shifting or inconsistent shelter populations that are new and different trajectories for them, a different animal behavior issues coming up. The needs of the community, uh, again, Javier, your uh, commitment to community service uh, really demonstrates that forward thinking uh, idea and the idea of focusing more on prevention, less on reaction, even the legal frameworks shifting around us, all pointing to that evolving community model. And so I wanted to take time now to ask you all to reflect on, given that you've been doing this strategic thinking, for your organizations and for the whole sector, how does this pandemic change that thinking? And maybe we'll, uh, Bruce, why don't we start with you? Um, I would argue not at all. Um, I think, and I think Javier mentioned it, it's, it's been about acceleration. There are things that um, we intended to launch this fiscal year as part of our strategic plan um, and, so we just accelerate it. We, we pan, planned on a get to it at some point this fiscal year. Well, we, we launched it three weeks ago because the need is now and people can't wait. So, um, and, and a lot of the things that in, in the articles I'm reading about post pandemic thinking, um, most of them aren't new. They're just um, uh, more, there's more pressure to implement some of them more quickly because of the pandemic. So I think, I think we were on the right track before, and I think uh, we're just gonna have to move down that track a lot more quickly than we thought we were gonna have to. Great, well, that, that's um, positive in that it isn't like we were fully, or you were fully on the wrong track. And so that's, uh, that's interesting. Um, Javier, how are you thinking? Is this, has this impacted your, your strategic thinking or some of the conversations that we've had in the past at all? 
Um, I would say what Bruce said, uh, I, I, I fully, uh, fully agree. And, um, you know, to be perfectly honest, it, 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 it gave us an opportunity. There's always hesitation to stop doing things because we've always done it. And um, this is an opportunity to kind of break with the past and run with the things that the community and the animals to need today. So we, we, we see this as, as a great thing and, you know, appointment only intake, we have done it before, but now there's absolutely no resistance to continue to, uh, to do that. Uh, the connection between, you know, the welfare of an animal and the welfare of the individual that is caring for that animal is again, it, 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 we knew it and, and Humane Canada has been the leader when with the link conference, uh, for example, where, you know, violence starts not necessarily or, or is a symptom of something else and getting, uh, I think the community staff or, or donors to understand that we, we have to do that. And the, the other uh, m more, um, in, in my view, from a strategic perspective uh, is interesting, but uh, yet complicated is consolidation. I, I very much like to extrapolate from other industries and from society to look at our sector because we are not uh, exempt of what's going on out there. And what we see is a lot of consolidation, bigger players, bigger players that they have the economy of scale to do more, uh, to be more efficient. And I think that our sector, um, we, we, we are very atomized. And it might be an opportunity um, to perhaps um, consolidate some of that work. Um, we have been, for example, approached for the first time ever uh, from the person that is coordinating municipalities in remote communities in, in Manitoba, saying, can we come up with a single plan to run wellness clinics and spay and neutering in, uh, in, in those communities? And it was about time that we had a conversation before we would go nowhere. And now we actually have that, that opportunity and that will mean coordinating uh, with uh, literally dozens of rescues that are doing ad hoc work into a more uh, comprehensive strategy. And, uh, you know, again, in the animal welfare, I find sometimes, you know, we're so unique and we don't like, you know, to, to even consider the, the process of amalgamation, but it's something that might, might occur. Thanks, Javier. It's interesting because we have had that conversation around aggregation and, and I think uh, a couple of districts down in the United States that have really aggregated up into an amazingly effective organization. So I hadn't, I hadn't really been entirely thinking about that, but even the consolidation of the Northern response is fascinating. Elise, what comes to your mind? How do you think, or has this um, crisis impacted your trend thinking or your uh, strategic thinking? Like I said earlier, I just think it makes things easier since like we have to focus on priorities. Well, then like you forget all the little details that keep your day busy and you go back into the priorities and these are the priorities. The only challenge I, I see in the next few weeks or months, it's like mental, mental health has always been a challenge in our industry. Um, people uh, are tired, uh, people face compassion fatigue, and I feel it's gonna be even more difficult. Um, it's hard to separate work from your private life. Um, for a lot of people, their private life is challenging. They have people around them facing difficult times. Um, our work at the shelter is even harder because the animals that come in are sicker uh, than they were before. We don't take those like healthy animals that can be reowned easily. So uh, what are we going to do about it? Um, can it's like right now, I think we are under pressure and we do those plans and we bring change, but are we going to sustain that for months? Um, being away one from the other also, um, it's, it's gonna be a challenge and I'm not sure how we can, um, how we will face that. Excellent point. Certainly mental health is critical uh, in this crisis and it was already a challenge for our sector. So thank you for, for bringing that forward. Um, it's interesting, 
around acceleration and what these opportunities provide us to accelerate, perhaps you could reflect on, given that we want to accelerate, given that we want to make these changes, how do we avoid the trap of inertia? As we do start to settle in, and this is the new normal, and we do start to, um, as humans, seem to get used to our habits, um, what is your advice for how we keep going forward with these important initiatives that we've wanted to change for a while? Bruce, it looks like you, uh, you might have an answer for us off the top. <laughs> well, um, I just, A, I don't think we're going to have a choice. Um, I, I'd like to point out, we don't know what the new normal is yet. Um, it feels like there's a new normal every three or four days. Now it's maybe spreading to every week or two we have a new normal. So that, that presents challenges in itself. And certainly early in, in the health crisis, that was our number one issue was our environment changed constantly. Now that it's slowing down, that's helping us move forward, I think, in, in, in positive directions but we're nowhere near ready for any kind of meaningful debrief of our entire arc of what we've done. Uh, I'm looking forward to doing that, but it could be a year before we're prepared to do that. I think uh, our board, we're due for a new strategic plan um, come next spring. And I think what we're going to be doing rather than a strategic plan is, is a, a business transformation plan. Uh, I think that makes a lot more sense in this kind of environment. The, you know, the basis of strategic planning somehow is uh, that next year is going to look something like this year and the year after that's going to look something like the next year. So um, we're just not in that environment now. So I think it is an opportunity to look inward, uh, perhaps uh, uh, a little more than we have. We, we do tend to uh, be helpers by, by, uh, temperament. Uh, and so we often look outward and perhaps not as inward as we should at times. Uh, but there's been tremendous opportunities within this too. And, and I think we're learning a lot along the way that's going to change us. I mean, just one example, we've, we've been challenged for um, many years with, with intake diversion uh, and tried to come up with ways that we could assist people who are considering surrendering their pet. Uh, and the challenge with that is by the time they call us, they've made up their minds. Um, and so it's no, I want to bring you the dog or the cat today. Um, because we haven't been accepting animals, we've we put in supports for those people, especially those with dogs, um, and, and helping them with behavior intervention. And I'm, I'm very excited to, to uh, get the results of that and whether there are dogs that are not coming in here because we were able to provide that intervention during this time that was not an opportunity before. So. Um, I also think we're going to be learning from one another all along the way. And, and the more we do this together, uh, the better off our entire movement is going to be. You made me think about uh, when you said a business transformation plan, perhaps we can all come together and have a sector transformation plan as well. Uh, Lise, what are your thoughts on how to, uh, your advice on how to maintain the momentum or the acceleration that we all desire as uh, as inertia will eventually start to pull us all back into old frameworks. Well, I'm not sure about that. I think the world we will keep changing around us. The community will keep changing. Um, the, 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 the city won't be the same anymore and the change will keep on coming. There will be more people losing their job, losing their home, needing help, animals needing help. Um, we are not sure yet like about the, those animal cruelty cases. Is there more cases? But there probably is more cases than it was before because people are struggling with problems in their lives. So we will have to adapt to that. So we can't like just sit there. It's done and we will be like this for two years. The world will keep changing around us and we will have to keep on adapting. So those past two months that we uh, had, well, that's our reality for the next few months or years, I would say. Over to you, Javier, what are your thoughts? Well, in, you know, I mentioned this before, um, th there were certain changes that were required that this situation have allowed us to make. Uh, and in, in terms of how, you know, we don't go back to inertia when things settle, you know, when you have such a massive societal 
issue. Um, I don't think that we will return to exactly what we were before. And if anything, for, for our team, it's something interesting has happened. The, uh, you know, everybody is always wary of meetings and we don't like them. And I'm doing my job, just you do yours. And, you know, I care about animals, I don't care about people. And the, the daily touch points uh, have been phenomenal in bringing people together um, and, and sharing information that is critical, but also how, you know, we do it kind of a checkpoint. How are we doing? Um, and, and some days that, you know, are more challenging than others and having, you know, being able to do that is important. And when it comes to the approach, you know, the sky has not fallen with the changes that we made. And we really strongly believe that we're taking care of animals and that we we'll continue to be vigilant. You know, animal cruelty is, as we said, a, a, a very important issue. And our, essentially our staff complement there is, is what it was before. We, we can't let that, uh, you know, go. And as people staying together longer or losing their, their jobs, um, it is, it, it is a, you know, an, an increased concern. And as also Bruce said, it's moving from uh, intervention uh, or remediation to prevention. It is way cheaper um, and more effective and more humane to try to address a problem before the person or individual saying, you know what, I just can't deal with this. So um, those are important. The, the other is stray cats. Um, you know, we're finding that the, rate, the success rate in reuniting cats, if they stay in the community, is far higher than bringing them all the way from, you know, uh, 25 kilometers all the way to our shelter. And as neighbors are noticing that it's working, I think that it's also going to help us with our diversion strategy and making sure that we save more animals than before. That's great. I, I think um, the idea of prevention and a more integrated animal um, social service model, which is a term that is being used a lot right now uh, to reflect many of the things that all three of you have uh, have brought up. Um, we are coming to the end of our time together, and uh, I'm sure there's many questions uh, from all of the folks that are watching right now, and that I hope uh, during the conference you'll be able to be available to, so that they can they can send you um, a question and and hook up with you. There's some really great social tools within the conference platform. But what would be your final thought or piece of advice that you would like to share with everyone who's watching, listening, and thinking about how to move forward and really advance animal welfare through this pandemic? At least, why don't you uh, why don't you start? Um, what comes to my mind is that, like the last two months, have been full of um, learnings, and uh, we learned that we probably learn that we can do way more than we thought we could do, uh, that we can change more and adapt more. So it's really something that we have to keep in mind. Um, we are probably way stronger than we thought we were. Thanks, Elise. Javier? This is something that I said pre-pandemic, but I still believe it applies today. Don't be afraid of making a change. Don't be afraid of trying something, even if it, not, it may not work exactly as you planned, uh, because paralysis is a way worse outcome than trying something new and learning about it and doing it better uh, next time. And the other thing that, uh, and I'm quite enough, you know, I, I, I wish I could do more uh, around the Humane Canada table that I, that I do, but the importance of having a network. I know that the teams from Ottawa and Winnipeg were talking a lot, and I wish we could do more with, uh, with Elise. And, and because as Elise said, we're really not that different. Mm -hmm. And the challenges are fairly similar. So why don't we share more? Why don't we use the technology now that we're more comfortable with it? to exchange information, learn from each other, and become stronger as a sector. 
Um, I so agree. I have to say, Javier, you posted onto our emergency management Slack channel really early on your um, uh, contingency plan. And I can't tell you how many people have told me from our membership that that's what they use. They grabbed it, they changed the words, they took out what was relevant, and they moved forward and they felt really confident about that. And so just that simple act of sharing what you already have. Uh, and just recently, I think maybe two days ago, Toronto Humane Society uploaded their roadmap to recovery. So how are they going to start ramping up their services again? It's very comprehensive, full of links and details. And so that's up there too, so that we can share or everyone else can see it and use it and hopefully shortcut some of the more tedious pieces of, of trying to respond. Thank you very much. Uh, Elise? Oh, sorry, you already you gave your thoughts. Thank you. Uh, Bruce? Well, I, I certainly agree with everything that Elise and Javier said. Um, I, I think the other piece, and when we talk about the need to support people, I, I absolutely agree. I come from human services. Um, it's just a little scary on scale. I mean, there are, I don't know, billions of dollars spent on social services. There's probably in Ottawa, there's 3000 charities um, providing services for humans and we're, we're the animal charity. And so it, it scares me a little bit saying, we'll take care of you. Um, that said, we have to, but I think we can do it by sitting at the table. And I, th I think as a movement, we've tended to talk to one another about animal and animal care and animal welfare issues um, and not sat at the big table. And I think we've earned it through this. And uh, I think uh, it's time we start approaching um, the work that needs to be done uh, with others who are better resourced than we are, frankly. Yeah, that's a great point, Bruce. I think this is that opportunity to expand our minds as to which tables we should be sitting at and making sure that there's a voice for animal welfare at that table. Not that we have to take care of every single human attached to a pet, but that we have to bring that relationship together and make sure that those, especially the decision-making tables, that there is a voice that is speaking about the impact on the animals in the community and their relationship. So uh, I think that's critical. Um, so we're, we're coming to the end. I, uh, I do want to just reflect, I've been writing as you've been speaking, and there's been some very common themes about going forward. The big one is intake diversion and how to shift that. There's several different ideas and possibilities. So sharing information on how everyone is, is attempting to do that is great and particularly around cats as we know uh, back when we first started talking about capacity for care there was a lot of pushback around intake diversion and it seems like this is going to open up some new possibilities for people uh javier i liked what you said about uh, that not being afraid to try things is really important and sometimes though our mental models don't let us we don't even realize that we could that it was something to try so this is opened up some mental models as to how shift can happen. The idea of community service and prevention, how do we focus and shift, particularly as we see shifts in our intake, um, how can we shift to prevention? Um, the links, the one health, one welfare concept and really working hard to make sure that that one health, one welfare concept is in the mind of decision makers consolidation, which uh, is a fascinating and, and huge topic. And of course, the mental health perspectives that we need to uh, always have in our minds for everyone. And then how do we sustain that change and have meaningful debriefs and meaningful learnings and really um, look at the transform business transformation plans and sector transformation plans. So thank you. Thank you so much, Elise. I know it's a tough time. For all of you and Elise in particular in that hot spot, it must be the mental health strain and stress on all of you uh, must be extraordinary. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Javier, for being here and taking the time to share with us and for all of your support for the whole sector and helping us move forward. Thank you very much, everyone.